Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, today we're checking out a video from Hozier that came out a few days ago that seems to be blowing up. It's titled, Saudi Arabia's Gamble to Stop a Total Collapse. So I've seen a lot lately, a lot of these videos that say some country or something's about to collapse. I talked about it in a recent video that you're seeing that with China, for example. My general response is that that stuff has usually been pretty hyperbolic, but I'm interested to see what his case is going to be for Saudi Arabia collapsing and what they're doing to try to stop it. All right, the original video is going to be linked down below. I encourage you to check that out first, and then come on back and you can see what I have to say. All right, let's get started. All right, I see oil on the first frame here, and that makes sense because Saudi Arabia's um, pretty much whole economy is based on being such a, a major provider of oil across the world. And if the world is truly going to be shifting away oil, which I think is going to be happening a lot, probably a lot slower than I think a lot of people realize, um, and then you know we'll see what we'll see what the role is here. So oil right. is done. Kind of. No. While it's oil not. continues <laughs> to grow, the International Energy Agency predicts that we could hit peak oil demand sometime in the 2030s, possibly as soon as 2028. Demand? Now, obviously, we will never be done with oil. There's a whole industry dedicated to turning the black goo into everything from mm. plastic to the clothes you wear and from drugs to the fertilizer that True. feeds you. These are all made with oil and it will likely stay that way for decades. I, that is true, you know, and I, I, I'm one that tends to forget that too about the multiple purposes of oil, of how important it is for so many things. Uh, most of us think about it as just in terms of of gasoline and things like that. One of the things I think too is that countries with strong infrastructures and high levels of, of capital are going to be the ones that could be shifting away, you know, sooner than others. There's some countries that may not have the investment to use other types of energy products and are going to be dependent on oil for longer. So mid to maybe lower uh, economic countries probably will stick to that longer. We'll see. But what is also obvious is that the world is trying to distance itself from its oil dependence. The EU and Japan have both pledged to have all new car sales be electric by 2035, and the world's two superpowers, America and China, are both investing hundreds of billions of dollars into national renewable energy projects. Add on top that oil is a technically finite resource, and now there's a strategic reason countries might want to shift away from it. This is interesting. So this is an oil map? Technically finite resource, and now there's a strategic reason assessed basins with resource estimate okay so this is actually good i've never really looked at a full really like global i guess oil map china seems a little odd there that seems just to be the country you know what i mean at least the southern half of it um yeah u.s very much a patchwork and a lot of that's going to be that uh, surveying has probably happened maybe a lot more than maybe in some of china so there's more like uh, uh there's more specific locations with that you see that going on um some big oil reserves uh found in guiana recently recently which has provided some geopolitical issues between venezuela and guiana we could see here in kind of the uh and it, this doesn't specifically say oil though assessed basins with resource estimate i don't want to go too far on this but We'll see. countries might want to shift away from it i'm sorry but it doesn't take a financial analyst to tell you that we're probably going to be using less oil in a couple decades than we do now this might be good news yeah. to you or to them but if your yeah. name is mohammed bin salman al Saud, Prince. this new world is what you've been dreading for years that's because our friend MBS is the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. And if you know anything about Saudi Arabia, besides the holy cities, deserts, and massive towers they have, it's that the Saudis have a lot of oil. When I say a lot, I mean an unfathomable amount of oil. Saudi you can Arabia fathom has it. Nearly a Espe fifth especially if it's a dying resource that people say is going to be gone, right? Of all proven <laughs> oil reserves, and unlike the country with the most, Venezuela, Saudi oil is both cheap and easily accessible. They have the world's largest onshore field at Gawar, Safania, which is the world's largest offshore field, and Abqaiq, the world's largest oil processing facility. Just Gawar alone is 280 kilometers long, 100 meters deep, and produces about as much oil a year as Kazakhstan does. Mm. And look at the Kazakhstanis' exports. 
This one no. field could produce almost 4 million barrels of oil a day until 2050 before it runs out. Mm. It can make it cheaply too. It's almost like, you know, kind of saying that Saudi Arabia will be one of the, potentially one of the last producers too that might make them <laughs> uh, more relevant that way. But yeah, it's <clears throat> impossible to, you know, to have a Saudi Arabia at around this, $4 right? a barrel to pump up Saudi oil compared to about $40 a barrel to frack for American shale. Mm. This makes the country as a whole the second largest producer of oil and with a relatively small population, easily the world's largest exporter. So, you know, the a major thing that's underestimated with it, it could be oil production, it could be mining is how easy is it to obtain? Like here in Saudi Arabia, it's very easy to obtain but if some places if the oil reserves are or you know, the locations of oil are very deep for example it costs more money to do that it's harder to, to to access same thing with offshore drilling how deep do you have to go right these are things that saudi arabia um has been pretty good with but you see like in the united states it's harder to uh, um um uh, uh to abstract that right which then brings in the 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 idea that like if you can get it from somewhere else cheaper and cheaper is always the thing that people go with, right? Then why focus so much on yours? So it's like the United States is going to be put in a dilemma here and always has been about balancing that oil. Cause the United States still produces most of its oil, but, um, it, if it's going to be cheaper, then you go there, right? The thing is, Saudi Arabia is producing far below its full capacity. Mm. As part of the OPEC Keeps cartel, prices up. Saudi Arabia has actually cut oil production yeah. through most of the 2020s in an effort to drive its price up. In 2022, after production cuts and the supply shocks coming from opening up the world and the Ukraine war, record high prices let Saudi Aramco, the state-owned oil company, report an insane $161 billion in profit. So this is where people will blame, it, like you see it all over the world, uh, citizens will blame their own governments for oil prices right that they're somehow in charge of such a thing when it's the oil producers that are the one that control the prices right because they can inflate it i mean why produce more like it doesn't make sense if you're a completely like autonomous uh um, oil producing company to be producing as much as possible because the more you're going to put on the market the lower the price is going to be so literally less work more money it balances out and it's going to cut your costs and your overhead that's why you're going to get insane profits and why during an oil is going always going to be recession proof of all the things that are going to be there so whether it's covid or uh, uh you know so you have a pandemic or some kind of economic collapse oil will always be there right so those <laughs> those uh, uh producers are going to thrive in those and even make more profits than normal as you saw on that previous graph there Right, look at record for incomes. an insane 161 billion dollars in profit. Man, Apple didn't even crack a hundred bills, which gets to a bigger issue in Saudi Arabia. They are absolutely dependent on oil. 40% of their real GDP countries ruined if it, if it does go and away. around 75% of average government revenue comes from digging up oil and marketing up its price. Saudi Arabia is a country with no income tax and a very odd <laughs> division of labor with a third of their population coming as foreign contract workers and over half of their working citizens working for the government. They also had a lot of foreign investment. So like the United States was a big one um, of investing there. It's why the United States and Saudi Arabia <laughs> are very close allies uh, which has also provided political problems because there are a lot of things the U.S. doesn't like about uh, the kind of basically how society is in, in Saudi Arabia with basically non sec. It's, it's not a secular state. Right. So you have that and then issues with other Arab countries. And that's why a lot of other uh, countries, too, may not like Saudi Arabia because they're also tight with the Americans. And it, it makes it a political mess, too. So, so much money is heading into Saudi Arabia and it's again brought problems like with Saudi Arabia and Yemen because like so much of that money went into there, but then that can be used to, to you know, fight against the Yemenis. You know, it, oil becomes very problematic um, and has been historically, you know, uh, geopolitically. As a country, they're absolutely dependent on this oil money coming up to the government and it's sprinkling down onto the citizens. They can produce a barrel of oil for around four dollars and kind of. I mean, I, I got to interject there because um, <laughs> the Saudi government controls everything there. I mean, it's going to go through them and they they keep a lot of that money, a lot of that money. Yes, they reinvest it, but 
They're among the wealthiest people in the world, this royal, royal family. This 76 or so dollar profit is what we call its rent, the oil rent. Saudi Arabia is not a working economy, you could say it's a rentier economy. And so, despite the world planning to reduce their dependence on oil, the country's doing two quite weird things. They'll still One have customers. is they're actually ramping up their oil and natural gas capacities with large-scale projects to tap, refine, and export previously Keep untouched it cheap. reserves. And two, despite the high prices of the early 2020s, there is a conscious effort not to spend the insane amount of money they're making. Why are they doing this? It's because the Saudis are preparing to gamble this money on a chance to save themselves. Otherwise, well, they're bound to fade into irrelevance along with their favorite material. How can they? <laughs> that thing's cool looking. What is that? They're bound to fade into irrelevance this car along thing. with their favorite material. Is this like a real thing? The cute little electric car. <clears throat> I was I was thinking as he was doing that, like, would a strategy be to make oil so cheap that it will overcome the push to try to be more environmentally friendly, potentially with, you know, like using electric cars and stuff like that. And, know, and we know there's there's plenty of, of uh, environmental issues, of course, that goes into um, electric car manufacturing and b b besides that. But make it be just so cheap that you almost can't use these alternatives. So do the opposite of what they're doing as as time goes on. How Again, like ramp this? up oil production, right? First. Let me tell you one reason why oil is so important. Defense. Can't run tanks and planes without oil. Right. One of the best ways to... And those aren't going electric anytime soon, right? War Thunder. It's the biggest <laughs> vehicle combat... All right, if you want his uh, code stuff here for War Thunder, you should go to the, the original video. Okay. But I was saying um, that, yeah, if you think about it, like what what's... Is, is like... Mil the military you think the like military vehicles and stuff like that planes tanks or whatever drones all those things um are those going to be you think converting later to alternative um alternative resources are going to be amongst the, the the least ones like you know what would be the electric power necessary to use a tank or a bomber you know what i mean premium account but only although we're also changing time. our our warfare so act now too. fast you know who else needs to act you know, drones fast? and stuff MBS. Like that. How does he plan on preventing an oil bust in Saudi Arabia? Vision 2030. All right, what's wow. he got? This is an ambitious, complete, and Saudis can be innovative. Though. Transformation of nearly everything in Saudi society by the year 2030. It wants to develop a thriving non oil economy, to be on the Ow. cutting edge of technology, and have oh, some of the center. best educational institutes in the world. It promises a vision of sustainability, investing billions into solar, wind, and carbon capture projects to make up for approximately 0.2% of their energy. Solar could be fantastic. For renewables them. to hit their goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. They're mm. investing into desalination plants and agriculture. And you know what? It's surprisingly kind of working. It's interesting they because it's like you're investing in the thing that's going to kill what your current economy is on. Not like a like a like a, a sidestep to some other economic venture, but directly investing in the thing. Like he was talking about solar, for example, for that. Um, and that makes sense. So you'd be like a not a Qatar because Qatar is still <laughs> very oil money, but be friendly to other types of international business because um, that's what they'd have to do, too. Right. They want to become a regional hub of finance and logistics with new financial tech developments in cities like Riyadh and Jeddah. They're investing into anything science. What type I'm of talking artificial intelligence, okay. literal flying cars, and the Saudi Genome Project. Spending on new housing built all over the country and most importantly in their new green capital of Riyadh. Spending on anything that will drive a new Made in Saudi campaign. A large chunk of what's actually being made in Saudi being petrochemicals. What are they going to power biggest it with? of all, they're investing into anything, anything that will drive tourists to come to Saudi Arabia. You almost wonder, okay, so tourism is not an issue for Saudi Arabia, okay? There are a billion Muslims, and every Muslim is required or is supposed to, suggested, <laughs> highly suggested, to <clears throat> go to Mecca, all right? Go to Mecca, go to Medina, go to the holy sites there. So 
you have that going on. I was wondering, because it's like still, how do you power all this? If you're going to make high tech factories and like all these sort of things, is that where they'll just keep their oil production and just almost use it for themselves while the rest of the world is moving on from other things? That was something that kind of came to mind there. But how are you going to be able to compete in the tech center with like uh, Japan? Um, India's tech center is is um, obviously very big. Of course, the United States, right? How are they going to be able to compete with that? What because, you- again, oil is a finite resource that they can control where other people can't. So how can they compete with those? Need in the know? modern age of mega cities and the Internet for tourists to leave their bubble and to come Brazil. To Brazil is a major one, too, by the way. Massive and unique. Like the Jetta Tower, projected to be the world's tallest building when complete. Just a big Trojena, a futuristic city that will act as a ski resort in the middle of the oh desert. My gosh. The Mukab. So that just doesn't make sense. Like, you don't need to be a, a futuristic city that will act as a ski resort. You don't need. Okay, it's just not necessary. Let let the ski places be ski places. All right. Try to get tourism based off of something else, not the exact opposite, just to make it like a a novelty to have this sort of thing. Hope they talk about if you heard about that, like walled city, it's not a walled city, but it's like this like narrow superstructure that's like supposed to be a city that's just like. Like the width of a wall, you know, a thick wall. You know, you know what I'm talking about? The Mukab, a 400 meter tall cube to host a sustainable mini city inside of. Kidia, a dopamine paradise where you can indulge in anything from a water park to cool Where's up the, the big to racing wall the city track, thing. to watching any type of sport to playing games in their esports stadium. Yeah, when it's burning and of hot. Of course, the line. Yeah, this Do thing. I even need to explain <laughs> this? <laughs> this thing. I have such mixed th- feelings about this. If you guys have heard of this, what do you think about this thing? Is it good? Like, I'm so, like, torn on it. Maybe it's just because it's such a weird concept. Okay, I, if you don't know, I, I'm Saudi interjecting Arabia to is really. planning on building a 170-kilometer-long linear city. Why? Because they want 100 million annual tourists coming to Saudi Arabia by 2030 to make up at least 10% of their GDP Seems like another with gimmick, 1 million though, right? citizens working across these insane projects. And they want to spread out the tourism gains as well. Sure, Saudi Arabia already has a thriving tourist industry, but it's mostly concentrated around Mecca, where every Muslim yeah, is encouraged they'll always to, have to that. at least once in their life. That's the thing. Islam's not going anywhere. It's projected to be the, the most uh, practiced religion within the next 50 years. They will always have that. But my thought was, you know, it, <coughs> that then their economy would just completely be on tourism. You know, But if you think these developments might all be a little too much to handle... I'd say you're probably right, but the it wall, surely the line. symbolizes the optimism and the desperation to reduce Saudi Arabia's dependence on oil. MBS himself has said Saudi Arabia has an oil addiction, and a direct goal of the vision is to diversify the economy to hedge against any future oil crashes. I mean, it's Getting true. You always want to do that. Is Every as country much for does. The security of the nation as it is for economic growth. The only thing is, the bill for this transformation, it isn't cheap. It runs up to the trillions of dollars. Trillions, over three to be specific. For their efforts, Saudi Arabia predicts the vision will create over half a million government jobs. But the oil-subsidized government job basically assigned to Saudi citizens at birth is something they're trying to move away from. One of their explicit goals is to create a booming and, importantly, profitable private sector. Either through increasing From where? participation, opening up foreign investment to whoever wants to do business, or what they're most accustomed to, just throwing billions of dollars at the problem. Because their government, if they want to privatize it, and the oil industry is <coughs> totally controlled by the your foreign investors <coughs> or the royal government. The people, what about the Saudis themselves? How are they going to benefit from this? Are they going to import workers like they do in like Dubai and Qatar and stuff like that. And the horrible working conditions probably heard about um, the conditions that they like, like uh, that Qataris or the, Qatar did for like the world cup, right? they bring in these Indian, um, especially like Indian workers or something like that. And, and it was horrible. Like people were dying and it was like underpaid and it was like slave labor. Like, are those issues going to be happening here? with Saudi Arabia where the people themselves aren't going to benefit because they're going to need that foreign capital or, I mean, I don't know what else they're going to do. Are they going to just shell out their money? Like the, the government's going to shout their money to their close 
you know, friends and, and just give them the manufacturing, you know, something like so when Soviet Union collapsed and they just, you know, basically gave all the industries to a handful of people. The size of their industrial policy would make Xi Jinping and Joe Biden blush. <laughs> and it's much more centralized in the hands of one man, too. The problem with this method is you don't know which industries are working and which ones aren't. Mm. A borderline infinite supply of money being handed to you is enough to make anything seem profitable. And this supply, even if it passes hands multiple times, is ultimately derived from their oil reserves. For example, Lucid, the first ever car manufacturer in Saudi Arabia making what will be luxury, never luxury heard of that. vehicles, are those cool? is 60% owned by the National Oil Fund. And across okay. the country, about 80% of non oil growth in the last five years has been driven by government spending, which is basically oil spending. The country is a long way from being financially independent from oil. So Do you think this stuff could lead to, um, I don't want to call it like a socialist revolution, but definitely a revolution by the people. If they continue to in <coughs> invest these things additionally on top of oil, and it's not going into the hands or empowering um, Saudi Saudi citizens and Saudi workers. Do you think they would ever rise up? You know, when that stuff has happened historically, like United States is also is an ally of Saudi Arabia. The United States would come in to, you know, and maybe indirectly help suppress that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, what do you think the the potential for social unrest? Part of the drive more. for the new private industry is to create a healthy tax base, something they're testing with a new tax on all goods and services. But if there are no benchmarks to assess the efficiency of the new ventures, well, I'm not sure there'll be great tax revenue for the royal family. And so the kingdom is in kind of a chicken and egg situation. If they don't explicitly invest into private business, then Saudi workers have no incentive not to just take their oil rent in a comfy government job. But if they do invest, then they're more dependent on the okay, oil rent to think than what ever, I was thinking about. creeping its way into everybody's pockets through their industrial policy. The crown prince needs more more than just fiscal responsibility to solve this. He needs fiscal wizardry, which is where this gaggle of sheikhs comes in. <laughs> the Public Investment Fund. It's one of the largest oil funds on earth that could ironically be their ticket the out of Iran's though? economy. It's a diversified portfolio investing in everything from Uber to Nintendo to all of these companies that manages over $700 billion of assets, closing in on one trillion. This is one of the main tools MBS is using to push Saudi out of oil, and the way it works is relatively simple. Instead of the government spending the oil money directly, worrying about fluctuating prices and production quotas, they pool a large part of the profits into this account, manage the money a little bit, let it grow, and then spend it in a more responsible way. That it way sounds like they're just like reversing everything that's been happening. It's like they're taking all this investment, <coughs> foreign investment that's come in for decades and century now, and then now they're going to put it back into corporate other uh, uh, multinational corporations. You saw that list there is like uh, like Walmart and it was Home Depot. They said Nintendo and stuff like that. So then they just become investors in everyone else. They're going to get into that. They're going to just, uh, become like a Switzerland. <laughs> it's a smooth flow of money coming down to the people instead of spending based on how high the oil price is on that particular day. This is the best way they can spend the oil rent on things with benefits like infrastructure, health systems, and education. And so the Saudi royal family is one of the largest domestic and international investors. Any major mm. tech company, they're in that. Saudi money. Video game companies, yeah. Yep. Electric vehicles, they've got money in that. Travel, bought it. Sports the teams. IF financed a brand new airport and airline and the most flashy industry they've recently gotten yeah. into. Yeah. Sports. That's so interesting because the sports thing is interesting to me because you see it all over. They're investing in you know, soccer teams. Um, <coughs> yeah, live golf, the, the alternative to the PGA like they've done. But the thing is, sports... Um, investing doesn't make money. It's 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 actually one of the worst things you could put your money into is sports. Okay, it can because they don't make a lot of money. I mean, it's it's over the overhead for sports teams is huge. Look at it. Many sports teams operate in the red. All right, the 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 owners of them that is not for almost every sports team there is. 
their primary income is not from that. They have something else that they made money from, right? This is like a hobby <laughs> or can also be used like for Saudi Arabia's case. I mean, I mean, making money off of it, but it also promotes them. It's, it's promotional. You become uh, well known. You're, it's like, it's like advertising yourself. And that's one thing I would assume why Saudis have been investing in sports is, is for that, to get their name out there to be seen as like a legitimate business partner for other businesses and stuff to invest in them, right? They're not making money off of these. Billions upon billions of Saudi oil dollars have found their way into international sports. The PIF See what they're paying Ronaldo United, and United. They own four clubs. Billion dollars and what they offered Leo they Messi. They Live Golf, which eventually merged with the PGA to the upset of many, many, many That was golfers. so weird. I still hit live. They signed Ronaldo. Still, did he say that? Many, is, that is, that Ro, or is that Rory? Many golfers. I still hit live. They signed Ronaldo <laughs> on a $200 million yearly contract to play for Al Nasser FC. They're hosting the 2020. I, I think, didn't they, didn't they offer like a billion dollars to Messi or something like that? Like it was like the money they're doing is nuts. It's so crazy. Dude. Asian Cup, the 2034 World Cup, and the 2029 Asian Winter Games. Yes, Winter Games in Saudi Arabia. Crazy. And they've invested heavily like into international tennis, geography boxing, and cricket, stuff. MMA, motorsports, like and horse racing. Why are they doing this? Top-down approaches generally don't work in sports. You can't force an audience to like a certain sport, especially if there's no folk culture of them playing it. Three simple reasons. They want eyes on Saudi Arabia. They want to delegate more to I private said. business, yep. like hoping the PGA will manage much of their golf scene for them. And, of course, money. Well, if a sport washing is going to increase my GDP by 1%, and then I will continue doing sport washing. <laughs> You're okay with that term? I, I, I don't care. I have 1% growth of GDP from sport, and yeah. I'm aiming for another 1.5%. Call us whatever you want. We're going to get that 1.5%. Sports owners do it for a hobby. It's a hobby. It's what they do, right? I mean, look, do you know how, like, when you see this everywhere, sports stadiums built. There are so many uh, sports teams or potential sports teams that, like, don't have the the money to like build their new stadium. So what happens? Literally, sports is so big in culture, and this is a big deal in the United States that um, local governments will fund it. State governments and counties will put up the money for the private business, you know, uh, owners to build these stadiums. They'll use taxpayer money to do it. So how much people uh, uh, love their sports. You don't see that with other you know businesses, but. It's just, you know, people love it. Right? Something similar goes for these insane giga projects they're planning. They need to be financed using the public investment fund or there would be no chance they could be built. The Does that mean it's coming back to the people? expected to cost up to half a trillion dollars. Oh. And let's be honest, that's just a guess this soon into the construction process. Okay, it'll be more than they're that. spending but it's on always all over budget. in an effort to attract tens of millions of tourists into Saudi Arabia who they hope will spend tens of billions of dollars. Will one of the largest government-led construction splurges the world has ever seen be enough to escape their oil rent dependence? Well, who knows? What do you think, Ozer? A couple decades time will tell us. But what's even the point? What is building I'll try to a make a decision by the end of this or too. buying Ronaldo going to do? Doesn't that seem kind of odd for a mass-scale economic development project? Well, one reason is branding. Brand equity matters as much for countries as it does for companies. And right now, well, Saudi Arabia spying. does not have the best record in the world. Even if you skip mm. past the human rights abuses, I'd bet most people think of Saudi Arabia as that place that sells oil to us, not the place we're dying to visit. If yeah. branding didn't it's matter true. in countries, then no, why if, are unless you're unless you're a Muslim, like nobody has a desire to spend the money of all the places that you can spend your money on tourism and even the things that they're saying there. Like if I'm an avid skier, <laughs> am I going to go to like Aspen, Colorado or like park city, Utah, or go to the indoor Riyadh ski fake ski facility? Like who is this for? You There's know? a million what could they actually who do? have never been to Canada that would immediately move there if they got the chance. It's because Canada has developed a brand of being a relatively safe 
open and wealthy country. It doesn't matter if you think that's true or not. That's the brand they sell the world. It's and it you. works. If Saudi can really sell the brand of being the new pinnacle of luxury and innovation, that could absolutely affect their ability to do business with and attract foreigners, putting the Saudi name mm. into the mind of everyone. Another they're, they're, my th I think for them to be the uh, uh, a destination for tourism, I think they're going to have to to become more secular as a country, right? Are people going to want to go in there if they don't agree with the uh, potential fundamental nature of um, of Saudi Arabia, especially from Western countries, you know, can they do that simultaneously and then track in the secular world? You know, I don't know. Reason their social contract is breaking as a raunchy economy. Most Saudi citizens have either been directly paid by the oil runs or benefited from the development subsidies and social allowances oil brings. And in return for the rent, the Royal family was given absolute control over politics, social, one of the last and monarchies on earth. But now that the government has explicitly said they their want kingdom. to distance themselves from oil, what happens to the social contract? Well, they're just making a new one, either from literal rents paid to the government by, say, massive sports enterprises, which would eventually make its way down to the people in the same way oil rents do, or by the brand name and coolness of the new developments. Yeah. Most yeah, Saudis cool. are quite young. Two thirds of citizens are younger than 35. This push to become mm. a global sports, luxury tourism, or video game hub is pretty clearly a aimed at hub. a younger audience looking for the best experiences in life. If they can find them without leaving their own country, all the better. All hmm. while the government eases on some of the more controlling laws they had imposed. Women can now drive, which is only... This is the stuff system. This is the stuff I'm talking about that people are going to disagree with. And in the United States, become a very... A thing that most people will... They kind of will get over because of the um, economic relationship with the U.S. But then they'll also be like, but we also don't like how their society is structured. And again, things with women driving cars because that was banned. Uh, you know, it's 2018 movie theaters are now open to the people. Music can be played out loud in public and alcohol can now be sold to non-Muslim diplomats. So, instead okay. Of I was going to say, contract, it's not just completely open. Cause that was one of its dry country. You better believe you better believe tourists are going to need to drink. You are not going to be able to be a dry country and do that. But then it becomes hard. Cause it's like the people there. Okay. And maybe you're devout. Maybe you're not because, um, consumption of alcohol is, is forbidden under Islam. Um, like, are you going to say, well, what about like the rest of us? Do we have to be a foreigner to consume that? Being a trade between obedience and oil money, it will now be traded for ski resorts, the World Cup. and That's what's going to have to happen for this plan. To be to honest, I think the second one is a little bit cooler. And the biggest okay. problem moving on from a Ronti economy is trying to solve or potentially make worse is exactly that, the rentiers. I'm talking about the Saudi citizens who find an easy job in the public sector and live out easy days with their new wealth. The average Saudi makes about as much as the average Canadian, but is less educated than the average Gabonese. Mm. That sounds like a great job to me, but for the nation as a whole, it's unsustainable. 95% of workers in the public sector are Saudi citizens, but citizens only make That's up around 17% of are Saudis I want to get this unsustainable. 95% of workers in the public sector are Saudi citizens, but citizens only make up around 17% of private sector workers, mm -hmm. with the rest of them being foreign contract workers. Mm -hmm. That's why the demographics of Saudi Arabia are so heavily tilted towards men. This bulge makes up the bulk of the country's workers. And so, the push Where the women to make go? a new Saudi Arabia isn't just a push for brand name. It's to get their citizens working in highly skilled fields. After all, economic development is usually just the development of skills across a large population. But if they can it's actually develop skills by throwing endless money at some industries and praying they make something innovative, that's to be determined. This is where I don't like with all these things they're being ambitious about. Are they all compatible with each other? That's that's where I'm concerned when east asia was developing many countries used exports as a benchmark to tell which manufacturers were working and which ones worked. by the way china saudi arabia china greatest ex uh, exporting country in the history of humanity um it's amazing that since ancient times when they first developed silk 
how they've been a country that's always focused on exports, always focused on exports, um, and have tried to fight if if that becomes an issue. Um, like when Europeans were coming in and trying to import goods and Chinese were like, no, we don't want to do this. But then you get like the opium wars or the uh, boxer rebellion or um, something like that, you know. Arabia probably needs some sort of measure to determine how well Saudi AI, Saudi EVs, or let's be honest, Saudi petrochemicals will do without government aid. Their government to private consumption is already around three times the world average. And with their current employment structure, it would be very hard to start taxing private citizens as the main form of state revenue. So to become post rentier by 2030, or sometime after 2030 more likely, it will involve sacrifices made by the citizens, something the kingdom does not want remembering the wave of revolts that spread across the Arab states in the early 2010s, ousting four governments in the process. If Saudi Arabia can become a highly skilled country with a high productivity, this program will absolutely pay off. It may be one of the first economies to escape the petrostate curse if it can pull it off. Otherwise, well, opening up society and building massive projects are cool, but economies are made by people, not by buildings. If the people don't benefit in some way, then it might be a sign they should have invested in more traditional <laughs> sectors. Saying, is there going to be a revolution? We'll just have to see if this particular gamble will make its way down to the people. It's like his whole thesis has come down to this will work if <coughs> they don't completely turn it to foreign investors and if the house of saud right the, the whole royal family government um will control it and have a system in place to make sure it benefits uh back at home rather than just sending money overseas then it will work all right final thoughts though I basically gave my final thoughts there. Thanks again if you've stuck with me this long um, there. That looks like that's come down to his kind of his, his uh, hoser's thesis there about who's going to control this investment and the profits from it and where are those going to go to. And again, uh, thought is did, did, were the, uh, the Saudi people in a, in a position, will they be in a position to demand that and be able to force that, whether it's through strikes or uh, I, don't, I don't want to say necessarily a coup or something like that, but what will be in their power um, to to establish this, right? Anyway, so yeah, interesting thought there. Again, uh, not as hyperbolic as I thought as far as like total collapse goes, because I'm still one that says that at least for a, a, a long time, Saudi Arabia will be relevant um, oil-wise because so many different parts of the world are going to keep using it. And also they can use it. I mean, they can use it for themselves too if they want to, uh, be able to have energy for all these projects and things that they're talking about. So um, anyway, okay. All right. What did you think about this though? What do you think about the overall kind of uh, thesis and claims made in this? Um, let me know down below. All right. With that, we'll see y'all next time.